Okay, folks, so far we have hovering around 68. I expect about 40 more people, but do not want to wait any longer. Um, welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Josie Badger and I'm the director of the RAISE Center. Um, RAISE works uh, to support parent centers across the country and in particular the eight RSA funded parent centers to make sure that we are serving um, youth who are transition age and their families um, into a successful adult outcome. Today, we are going to be having a webinar called A New Parent Training Resource, Helping Families See Possibilities in Employment. And we are doing this in collaboration with REAL, which is the Region A2 um, RSA Parent Center. Um, and we are really excited today to be here with Sean Roy, who's been a friend of ours for a long time, um, and he works with Transcend. So I'm going to turn it over to Miriam for all the the know-how details. Thank you, Josie. Um, good afternoon. My name is Miriam Alisa from the Race Center, and I'm going to walk you to some of the features that are uh, offer Zoom. And uh, if you would like to ask questions to the presenter, please uh, use the Q and A um, feature over there. And if you have any questions regarding technical issues with the platform, please use the chat box. Uh, we have um, a closed caption here provided by Zoom. If you wanna use closed caption, click where it says CC on your screen in the lower area or the upper area, depending on your settings. We are also, we also have interpretation to Spanish. Para acceder al canal en español, van a ver en la banda o cinta negra un globo que indica interpretation. Haga clic allí y luego seleccionan español y oprimen donde dice mute original audio. Esto último filtra completamente la señal en inglés para que puedan escuchar con claridad a nuestro intérprete de hoy, Sergio. And we also have American Sign Language. Uh, to, to pin it, please uh, go to um, Tina over there. You see the three dots and you click on it, you hover over it and you can pin it. We are also pinning it, it on our side, but you can do that from your own screen. Okay, so next slide. And then, Sean, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you, Josie and Miriam, and welcome everybody. Um, it's good to have you here. Um, we're talking about a new parent training resource, helping families to see possibilities in employment. My name is Sean Roy. And I am, I currently serve as the chief innovation and training officer for an organization called Transcend. We're a national training and consulting organization um, focused on promoting meaningful work and community inclusion for individuals with disabilities. Um, this slide kind of allows you to meet me a little bit if you've never met me before. Um, uh, first and foremost, for our purposes here, I'm a sibling of a young uh, young man, eight years my junior. It's uh, Andrew and I in the upper left. Um, we're outside of an arena before going in to see a rock concert. Um, Andrew uh, currently is competitively employed, receives uh, various services. I generally talk about um, Andrew as we go through um, the session. I'm also um, a dad. I've got two boys in college, um, so I have no money. Um, I've got an older son who's at Iowa State, younger son who's at University of Wisconsin Stout. Um, very proud of both of them, and we're experiencing empty nest. Um, I spent many years in the parent training world. In fact, uh, 15 years I was at the Pacer Center here uh, in Minnesota. So I'm coming to you outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I help direct the transition projects at the Pacer Center. Um, and that's where I did a, a great deal of family training and, and training for professionals and just thinking about this idea of how do we engage families better in transition and employment. 
And there's a great deal of demand uh, for that type of thinking and that type of work. So in my work uh, today with Transcend, I do a lot of training around engaging families as well as around employment um, and uh, transition services. So again, as Josie mentioned, been a friend of Ray's for quite some time, always appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, collaborate with, with them. And so thank you for your strong interest in this topic. So we're talking about employment today um, and and the need in general to improve uh, employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities. Those employment outcomes have been stagnant and, and especially for those individuals with more higher support needs, the competitive employment outcomes have been stagnant for a long time. And so our goal here is to give families more positive messages about employment and to offer them strategies and tools so they can advocate for employment and specifically for a strength-based approach, right, um, for employment. I think it's so important, the messaging that we send families and, and parent training centers uh, have just such a strong role to play in making sure that families understand early on uh, that work is possible. Um, I show you this picture. This is a, a young man in Pennsylvania. Um, his name is Johnny Williams, but he prefers to be called Johnny Blue Snake. Uh, and the reason is because his name is Johnny. His favorite color is blue and his favorite animal is a snake. And Johnny um, is, uh, among other things, works at uh, two local restaurants and publishes his own books. Um, but the reason that I show you this picture is because um, when Johnny was little, um, his, uh, his mom was told that he would never work. And Johnny is is very and a very articulate and engaging young man. I had the opportunity to co-present with him about a year ago or so ago. And and just just wondered if it wasn't for, you know, mom's persistence. Uh, and I, I'm just glad that she didn't take that advice or that messaging. Right. And so we can change the way that families view employment. And that's really what this webinar is about, is I want to show you a resource that we created that you can use to be able to change the way families see employment. But it's not easy. Um, in fact, we are up against a lot of challenges when it comes to um, talking with families and when it comes to being advocates for employment. We're up against a lot of things. Our, our systems are still deficit-based, meaning that you have to um, have a certain type of disability to qualify for certain services. And, and we tend to think about people with higher support needs in, in certain relatively narrow ways. And, and then, therefore, families get mixed messages about the role of, of competitive employment. And in a lot of cases, they're being forced to choose between, hey, do you want a day program or or to to pursue competitive employment? In a lot of our states, our uh, sheltered work settings are closing, and that's then generally seen as a good thing. But um, you know, families are are now going to need some support in embracing the idea of employment as as an option, and we need some flexible service options because right now, a lot of our service options are inflexible. You know, there's some states, for example, where if you receive residential services, it is all but impossible to be able to gain um, competitive employment. So there's a lot of barriers that we're up against, right, as advocates, as people who are working with families and who, who are working on behalf of individuals. Um, and so these are, are some of the things that we're trying to combat. Now, is... Um, is, is one parent training resource going to uh, combat all of these things? No, they're absolutely not. So what we did at Transcend is we partnered with RAISE to develop a three-part parent training workshop. Now, I must acknowledge that uh, I've been doing parent training for a long time, over 20 years. And so a lot of the uh, a lot of the ideas are not new ideas. Right. And there and you all have been doing workshops around employment for a long time as well. 
But what we wanted to do is give you an updated resource. So if you do work in a parent training program or a school, or if you're an advocate, you have some tools that you can use to talk with families. Now, I know that not everybody on the, on the webinar today is going to run out and do parent training workshops. I get that. But what I'm hoping is by listening to the information presented today, that you at least will have some tools and strategies to have better conversations with families about employment. And so that if that is the outcome, I think that is a, a great outcome. So I'm going to rely on, on the race folks to let me know if there's anything that I need to attend to yeah, via the chat box or the Q&A. Um, as, as was said, if you have any questions as we go through, feel free to throw questions in the, in the Q&A. If you have any reactions to what it is that's being said, go ahead and throw them in the chat box um, and, and we'll, we'll move forward um, kind of with uh, what it is that we put together. So there's this a is a reaction, Sean, there's a reaction. Okay. Uh, in New Jersey, sheltered workshops are alive and well, unfortunately, I guess. Well, and, and this is the case in a lot of states, including um, including my home state. Most of the states are working towards closing those sheltered workshops. Uh, you may have heard the terms provider transformation, um, employment first efforts. Um, a lot There's a lot of work that's being done, but absolutely in those states where there still are sheltered employment, it becomes a challenge to... Um, it becomes a challenge to talk with families about what uh, the benefits are of a real job, right? Because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so certainly appreciate that. Sean, so we also have a question on if you can con define competitive employment. Absolutely. You know, in my mind, well, actually, let me let me do this. Um, I'm going to I'm going to define competitive employment within the context of these materials. And so that you, your your question will be answered in that. And so let me um, let me launch into this, and then I think that you'll see kind of how we put it together. And if there's additional questions about the definition of competitive employment, we we can move forward with that question. So this is a this is a parent training curriculum that has been broken up into three parts. And each part is, is roughly designed to be delivered in maybe a half hour, 40, 45 minutes. If you choose to do them all in one part, it probably would take you about two hours. Now I'm more used, I'm, I'm kind of old school. So I'm used to parent workshops that last two hours. And, and, and I'm, I'm more comfortable in that format. But you might have a format where you 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 do things in a little bit smaller chunks, and that's why it was broken up this way. So it's three chunks, but it's all designed to be one workshop. You can do this virtually, or you can do this face-to-face, -face, or you could do even a hybrid of the two if you wanted to. And so the name of the workshop itself, right, is Imagine the Possibilities, A Path to Employment Success. But then we break it up into three different modules, and it's module one, which is employment as part of a good life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you these slides, and then at the end, Josie's going to show you where these slides are on the RAISE website. You guys could grab them today if you wanted to, because they're there. They're, they were developed for you as a resource. So you'll notice that some of the slides have things like on the bottom, presenters, add information, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's because we want you to customize these to your needs. We want you to put your own information in there. You certainly can feel free to add or subtract information. All we do is ask that you make sure that the information is accurate, right? Because our responsibility as people who train families is that we give them accurate information. So let's. what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the slides. I'm going to kind of talk you through why I added certain pieces and some of my observations in working with families for 20 years. And then we can you can kind of see how how you and think about how you might deliver some of this information, right? So here's an agenda for module one. Now, for all of the, the sessions combined, we use a worksheet. 
I'm going to show you what that worksheet looks like. But if we were together with the family, we would explain that this first module is really just about examining work and why is work important and what is work and, and looking at expectations and building a vision. Um, that is what we want to start with, with families. You know, you'll notice that I don't talk a lot in these modules about services. I don't talk about here's how you qualify for blank. That can come later. But I don't want families to think that the that the only thing to think about when it comes to employment is getting a service. I want them to start thinking in very hopeful and energetic terms about their son or daughter as people who can contribute to an employment situation. And we have to change that mindset of, of people with disabilities as just users of services. And we got to move towards that other piece. So that's why you're, this isn't a typical parent workshop. Uh, where this is really focused more on on strategies and skills and strengths than it is on uh, qualifying for services. So this is the worksheet, and this is part of the materials that are on the website. So what I do is I make copies of this worksheet and I give it to the families and the students that attend. I strongly encourage that the students attend the family workshop right alongside their mom and dad or their caregivers, because that's who we're talking about. We're talking about the kids, right? So the very first question is question number one, which is on the upper left. And I say, I want you to think about your son or daughter in five or 10 years. What do you want adult life to look like for them? And I make pens available and I ask them, I give them a few minutes to write down in bullet points what they want a good life to look like for their family member. I also want the students to do the same. What does a good life look like? Now, and then when, when they're done, I ask people to report out. What do you want life to look like, right? And I, I say, let's not think about what, what you think life can look like because they have a disability. I want you as a parent to tell me what you hope adult life will look like for them, right? Let's, let's get this thing started on a very positive path. So then we launch into the content after we do that. Now, for, for a lot of uh, people attending, this is going to be the very first time they even think about employment. And so I want to start with the very basics. People with disabilities are doing amazing things. They're going to college. They're owning their own homes. They're getting married. They're starting their own businesses. They have hobbies. They're happy. And, and so we need to start off when we talk with families about employment from a very positive mindset. People with disabilities are doing amazing things, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And we're never going to lie to anybody in, during our workshops. And so we, we, we acknowledge that the employment rates are still not where we would like them to be, that there's um, poverty. Uh, people with disabilities tend to live in, in poverty. Uh, they have limited housing options. They sometimes struggle with social recreational relationships, right? There's isolation. They struggle being a respected voice in their own lives and to de determine their own futures. I want to give them both sides of the story, right? Because some people respond to the positive and some people respond to the negative. And there, there, there is a, a problem that we're trying to address by conducting the workshop. So this is just a section break, um, and we start in talking about why employment is important. And I tend to, when I when I present this, tend to pull one of these things. If you remember three things about this workshop, here are the three things that I want you to remember. And I think this is so important for anybody that works with families or anybody that works in, in employment period. Number one, everyone can work. Everybody can work. Everybody has a skill that if we find it and we nurture it and we find the right, um, the right situation, they can lend value in an employment situation, right? Everybody can work. Um, we know how to do this. It's just a question of, of sending the right messages. But number two, work looks differently for everybody. So a lot of times you'll notice when families think about employment, they think about it in terms of the way that they engage with employment, right? 40 hours a week and, and, and supporting themselves fully and going to a job and working a certain pace. 
And what our job is to tell families that we can find employment situations that fit what a person can do and where they can be the most successful. And if a person works competitively eight hours a week with support, that's still a competitive job and that's okay, right? So work looks differently for everybody. And finally, employment should be rooted in what your family member wants to do. We need to get out of the habit of assigning people with disabilities jobs, right? Oh, what kind of jobs can they do? Oh, what kind of jobs does nobody else want? That's not a very respectful or strength-based way to look at employment. If an indiv we, we need to start with learning what the individual wants to do because that's how we're going to make a good job match, right? So then we go to what's kind of happening nationally. And, and, I, uh, and I tell people employment first is not a program. It's an ethic. It's a, it's a policy movement that says that employment in the general workforce is the first and preferred outcome in the provision of publicly funded services for all working age citizens with disabilities, regardless of level of disability. And, and the reason I want to tell families this is that I want them to know that things are happening in this country to move us away fr from things like segregated work and non-work day programs, that the first thing we should look at is employment. We don't screen people out of employment. We should screen people into employment. But to answer the question that came earlier, what is a job? And this is a great question because if you talk to families of, of individuals who are in sheltered work, the families will say they're working. If you talk to families of individuals who are volunteering, they'll say they're working, right? So what is a competitive job? All right. A competitive job, first of all, it's chosen. It's based on what a person wants to do. It's not necessarily given to them. Now, is that always going to be the case? Not necessarily, because some people don't always uh, express a lot of insight in terms of what they want to do, or they're perfectly happy doing anything. It's also integrated. So you have the opportunity to work alongside people without disabilities, and you have opportunities to interact so you can work a competitive job, but not be integrated. If you don't, if you work a job, but nobody invites you out to happy hour and you don't get the turkey at Thanksgiving and you don't get to go to the Minnesota Twins game during the summer with the rest of the company, then it's not an integrated job, right? It's a it's real employment, meaning that your your paycheck comes from the business, not from a service provider. And this is a, a important distinction because if your paycheck comes from a service provider, that business at any given point can say, yeah, we're not working with the service provider any longer. And then the person loses their job. And then finally, it is at minimum wage or prevailing wage. The prevailing wage is the industry standard wage. If individuals get paid uh, $3 above minimum wage starting working at a warehouse, that's what a person with a disability should get paid to. They get paid the same amount of money as other people. So that's what a competitive job is. A competitive job is in the community. A competitive job is alongside people without disabilities doing real work for real pay. That's what a competitive uh, integrated job is, or CIE, as it's often referred to. So why should people with disabilities bother to work? Boy, I hear this a lot, and I'm sure you guys do as well. I hear things like, oh, he doesn't understand the value of money. Why are we having this conversation? Um, and so it's important that we let people know that there's benefits to employment that go beyond just money. It is, it is first of all, what is expected of us as adults. It uh, increases socialization. It gives our day's purpose. Sure, it gives us money. It promotes mental health. But what I like to talk about is that it elevates social roles. Our social roles in this country, in large part, come from the fact that we're employed. If you have a job, you have an elevated social role in this country. And there's no reason why individuals with disabilities can't have that same elevated social role. Um, we, we, we enable um, individuals to have different 
isolated social roles by by saying that they don't have to work, you know? Um, and if you're capable of working, you should work, right? Because they can. Now, families might have different opinions about that. You might have different opinions about that. But I feel very strongly that if an individual can work, they should work, right? Because there's so many different benefits of the employment situation. So from this point forward, what we do in this next module is we, we go into another section where we encourage people to, to take a look and begin seeing their family member in a different way. As I mentioned earlier, I want to get away from this idea of my, my family member is a person with a disability and that's it. And I want to get more towards, you know, my family member has hopes and dreams and, and skills and capacity, and we want to utilize that. And to get to that, I think it's important that we talk to families about expectations. So I have been looking at the idea, and as of many other people, right? It's not just me. A lot of people have been looking at the impact of expectations on the way families make decisions, on the opportunities that are made available to individuals. And so I'd like to, I like to have this conversation during these workshops with families so they know, right? So they can begin asking themselves, where did, where did this come from and why do I believe what I believe? So an expectation is really a belief that somebody will or should achieve something, that something is likely to happen in the future. Really what we're focused on is this idea of high expectations which in this case is the belief that a person with a disability or any other barrier can achieve the same life and have the same life choices as everybody else. And I will tell families quite often, if you um, have a low expectation and you convey or you talk about that low expectation in meetings, then that's the exact same expectation everybody else is going to have. But if you're a family that talks about things and, and that are possible and has high expectations, then um, those are the expectations that uh, I think others are going to have as well. So expectations are really important. However, as family educators, right, we understand how low expectations can be formed. If you're a family member and you, if you're a, a parent or a caregiver and you have a child with a disability, you're not exactly inundated with positive messages about what they're what they're going to achieve in the world. So you you hear nothing but negative or tempered things about your child. And so it's it's I guess my message here is that I understand why you would have low expectations, but let's take a look at those expectations, right? Let's take a look at those expectations and then say all right, the secret is not letting other people's ideas impact what we believe our family member is capable of. So we want to get families in the mindset that they're in charge of their own expectations. They know their son or daughter better than anybody else in the world. So we want them to use that. We want them to believe that. We want them to think about high expectations as being um, important. So here is a little bit of an exercise that you can use within um, uh, within the workshop, right? So I, I ask people to think back. I just want you to think back here. And this again, these slides are the actual slides that are going to be available to you that you can use with families. So I, I ask the people, uh, what are your experiences? What were your experiences and perceptions of individuals with disabilities before your child was born? So what kind of exposure did you did you have to it before? What kind of experiences did you have with your child's pediatrician? What kind of messages were sent? Well, how did you feel about it after those conversations? What about with your child's kindergarten teacher or with your friends as your ch child aged? Uh, did things change? Did people temper their comments around you? And then you could, you could do this uh, activity within your workshop, again, which is name two individuals or situations that helped you have high expectations for your students' educational future? And what are two situations or messages that negatively impacted your expectations for your child's education future, right? And so again, we're just trying to get families to see the impact of other people and the messaging that they've got and, and see if we can't change that a little bit within the course of, of what it is we're trying to do together. 
Um, John, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. We have a comment and a question. Let's do it. Um, the, the comment is high versus low expectations can have cultural and familial implications. And the question is, it doesn't appear we have the capability to edit the slides and tweak it to match our communities. Was this intentional? Well, I, I'm not sure why you can't edit the slides. I, I, I'm, I guess that's a question for um, the race folks. Uh, the, the intention was uh, that they be fully editable, right? And get to you in a format where you could change them. You know, there, there's no reason why this information has to be presented in the exact way that I'm presenting it. And and so my hope is that we can make available um, a format that you guys can add information, add pictures that are representative of your communities, um, add resources that are representative of, of where you live. All of that is is the hope of of this. I don't know if the race folks want to jump in and and or or if 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 yes, you know, I can jump in for the purposes of the website. The slides that are over there right now available are on PDF because it's a lot easier for the website to hold them. Okay, that's why they are not in PowerPoint. But uh, certainly, we can send everyone who registered for this webinar. We can send them the PowerPoint. I, I'm not sure if the question is for these slides or for the modules that are already available on the website. The modules are, they are there. Okay. So there, that probably answers the question. If you go, and Josie's going to show us where they are at the end. If you, the, so where these are posted on the website, you can grab them in a PowerPoint format. The um, slides for the webinar today were just given to you in a PDF. Um, so you need to go and, and get the slides. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk a little bit though. And then, so we continue on this expectations. Um, we talk about the importance of having high expectations, right? So family set the bar for how the rest of the world sees the, the, the individual. And so we give them some information. Again, we're trying to empower the family's subtle mindset. Now, this is where some Sean information comes in. And, and so there are presenter notes for, um, for these, uh, for these tools. You, it, it's my way of explaining to you why it is that I added certain things. They're not a script, but it is just say, what did, what did, what did he mean by this? So number one, we, I, I like to talk to families about the balancing act and, and, and acknowledge that, they are uh, they are kind of asked to walk in two worlds. On one hand, uh, oftentimes we ask uh, families to represent their loved ones in the worst way possible so they can get services. That happens with social security. It happens with voc rehab. It happens, you know, you got to be disabled enough to be able to get services, right? On the other hand, you've got advocates coming and saying you need to have high expectations and great things are possible. And we understand that that's a balancing act. I get that. I get that it's kind of asking you to walk to different worlds. It, what I would err is err on the side of thinking positively and taking a strength-based approach, but navigating necessary services in such a way that you can still get the supports that, that you need. I also like to point out that there is no real timetable here for what it is that we're talking about in employment. And, and so it may take individuals longer to be able to launch into this world than others. And that's okay. I think the transition years in particular are very tough on families because uh, that's when the differences between their kids and other kids tends to get exposed the most. Um, after people leave high school, kids are going off to college or going off into the military or going off and starting families. And and, and our kids with disabilities are, are either transitioning into 18 to 21 programs or they're, they're staying home. And so there's no timetable for this. Um, we, we continue to work. We encourage families to say, you, you, you give your kids opportunities to practice, give your kids opportunities to try things, and they will eventually launch into employment and, and 
uh, whatever the good life looks like for them. But patience is really the key to do that. And then finally, it's um, I like to talk about the definition of success, right? And so um, we, uh, in general, need to stop um, stigmatizing the idea of failure for people with disabilities. I've talked to so many families who said, well, we've tried employment and it didn't work. And it's because it wasn't a good job match. It's because maybe something went wrong on the job. And, and for people, we, we, we give people with disabilities kind of like a one strike and you're out mentality. But, but if, we, if we say, you know, there's a lot of things in our lives where if we tried it the first time, we wouldn't be successful. But if we were given the opportunity to continue to practice, we, we might be able to master. And um, the picture of a, of a race is very intentional here. Um, because if if you asked me to run a 10K right now, I couldn't do it. But if you gave me a year to practice, maybe I could. Or I'd come close, which would still be a success, right? So success in employment, we need to give people the grace to be able to, to try and give people uh, to grow and to learn new things, right? It's not going to happen right away. And it's not going to happen without bumps in the road. So during this section, I like to show people a tool that we use at Transcend. Um, it's called the Positive Personal Profile. And this is a copy of the Positive Personal Profile on the screen, as well as it's part of the materials that are being shared with you for the parent workshop. And it really is just a one-page document that helps us take inventory of all of the positive things that a person brings to the employment situation. And it gets us away from that deficit-based mindset, and then it brings us towards a strength-based approach to looking at employment. This can be shared with IEP teams. This can be shared with um, case managers and vocational rehabilitation counselors. And this is in those of you that do employment services, this triggers what we often refer to as customized employment because it a, triggers a discovery process. But I like to share this with families because if we explain that if we find really good information about their son or daughter and fill it into these boxes, we can share that with the people that are working with them. And we can, again, shift the focus away from deficit and more towards strengths and interests. This is another tool that I absolutely love. Um, this is called a vision statement. And this is a real example of a vision statement. Andy Meredith is the young man on the upper left. And this is his vision for what a good life looks like for, for him. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, that what a great way to represent a person's good life and a person's strengths. This is a free, uh, so the link on the uh, on the left is uh, brings you to the University of Kentucky and the website that has this template for free. So it's a blank template that individuals or families can fill in their own pictures, fill in their own information and create um, positive vision statements for their son or daughter. What a great resource too. You could share this with schools. You can share this with anybody that works with the, with the, um, the young person. Um, and it really is taking that positive personal profile information and concept and, and translating that to a, a really printable, beautiful vision. Now, imagine using this as a resume instead of just the boring old white piece of paper. You know, this really tells the story about an individual. Uh, and, and again, this is just one of the tools that I love to share. I think every Every person should have the opportunity to express what their vision of what they want life to be. And a lot of families can help out with that. So that's the end of the first module. Again, there's smaller chunks. The takeaways here, everybody can work. There's a lot of benefits to employment. Family expectations are influential. And let's take a strength-based approach to employment. So if you're breaking this up into chunks, you might say that there are two additional modules. If you are doing this all as one work, uh, workshop, I would take out these slides and I would just continue then right into um, the information in the next module. Um, so 
We, of course, uh, leave time for questions for the families, and then we encourage you to have your own contact information um, of you, of anybody there that's a, that that is relevant um, to uh, to the um, proceedings. You know, for example, I've seen uh, uh, one cool way that I've had this done is um, people will put on a transition fair. And then they'll invite somebody to do this presentation as kind of the keynote of the transition fair. I did that in California um, last year. And it was just, it worked out beautifully because the families got a chance to go around and see resources that were local. And then I came in and gave this information and then they were all connected to the people in the room that that could they could go and ask questions about voc rehab or they could ask questions about social security. Um, so that's the end of module one. Do we have a question? Um, I, I think we do. Um, we can uh, we can give the mic to Roberta. Roberta, um, hold on one second. Let's do that. Let's um, unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Okay. Thank you, Miriam. Um, Sean, I I do a lot of work with a, a very wide intersection of people. And one of the one of the problems that um, we look at is um, when you say low and high, um, you know, in some families, the expectation is based on family need, uh, maybe a, a child going into the family business and supporting the business in that way. Um, and so those expectations, I think, I think there has to be a cultural sensitivity um, to what we see, right? When we go into this arena, what we see as a low expectation versus a high expectation. Um, and maybe we just start out at expectations and what they're based in. Um, you know, for some families, um, the the child coming, the adults, the transitioning young adult coming into the family business may seem to be the absolute greatest expectation, but for that child, it may not be. For that young adult, it may not be. And for those of us in the arena of helping with that transition to employment, um, I think that there's just a, a, a lens that has to include that um, and not in a diminishing way. Roberta, I could agree with you more. And that's why the slides are 100% fully customizable. Um, you, you, if you as a professional that works with a certain community recognize that there's language that, that you feel needs to be modified, then you modify it. Absolutely. Thank you, Sean. I think this is great. I don't want to take away from this at no, all. No, I think not at wonderful. all. And, and so part of the challenge is that, you know, um, you, you, and, and part of the reason why I'm so adamant that this be customizable is that you really can't create a resource like this and, and have it be applicable to everybody at, at all times, right? And so um, I, I, I very much appreciate the, the insight in terms of how the language would be perceived. And so if that is, a, if that is an issue, um, I would say... I would say absolutely modify it. You know, this is just, I, I think these, are, I would say this is just bones. This is just bones of a conversation that you guys can have with families and that um, you, you would, you may choose to spend a little bit more time on one thing than another thing. And that's one of the benefits of why they were broken up the way they were. Cause you could say, listen, I'm going to do a full hour on module one and we're going to, we're going to, have a discussion about um we're going to have a discussion about expectations but we're going to do it through a real culturally competent lens and and that would i would love to hear how you do that and see how you do that um you know uh, a friend of mine does a lot of work in the amish community in indiana and so a lot of what i'm talking about wouldn't play very well within those types of communities right because they they tend to have some expectations or 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 the 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 kids tend to stay at home they they tend to work at the family business they tend but but all kids do 
So we have to be very careful about, about a lot of that stuff. I So great comment. Thank you so much. And my, my response is, as, as professionals, you guys take this and run with it and just make sure that you're, you're doing, you're kind of applying what you know about working with families. That's great. Oh, sorry. You. Thank you, Sean. I'm still here, but thank you. That was perfect. Miriam, oh. I type thank you in the thing. Take my mic away. <laughs> no, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. I see we got a couple, a uh, couple of others. In the Q and A, yes, uh, there is a question from Leia. The question I have, I had, are reasonable expectations. How to set reasonable expectations? We do the person-centered planning with families, and sometimes families, due to cultural or family history, are worried about having reasonable expectations for their loved one. Mm -hmm. That's a question yeah. from Leia, and uh, one from. Racing, what type of people, agencies, do you usually see um, press, present these trainings for families? I work for a school district and think this would be great for families, but I don't know who would be the best agency to give it. I really like your transition fair idea. So I'll, I'll go... Um... I'll go to the last question first. I think that anybody can deliver this information. Um, and uh, but what I my suggestion would be if you work with a school that you find your state's um, parent training and information center and ask if you can partner with them on this um, and say, you know, hey, would you be willing to come in and help me deliver this information? We'll set up a transition fair. You know, you can you can meet the families. You know, I don't want I never want people to feel like they have to do this by themselves. Um, and so it, it, partnering is always the best idea. Um, you know, the idea of reasonable expectations is really tough because it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, I, I tend to err on the side of, you know, it's not our job to be the reality police and things tend to kind of play themselves out. So sometimes I hear the family has an unrealistic expectation that their kid is going to be a lawyer. And I'm like, well, then go ahead and start down the path of being a lawyer, because if they truly can't be a lawyer, that really is going to play itself out pretty quickly, isn't it? And so then we start conversations about, well, what is it about being a lawyer that you really wanted to be? Was it that you wanted to work in an office setting? Was it that you have an interest in the law? Was it that you had a family member that that was a lawyer and and really helping people untangle the whys? You know, why? Why is that? Right. That I think that is really important. But I get it. I get that it's a challenge. Right. I get that. I get that it's a challenge. And, and people's perceptions of disabilities can also be a challenge. So, Mary, and I'm going to ask that we move forward with module two real quick and save the questions um, because. These are excellent questions. I just want to make sure that we're able to get through the rest of the modules. Um, um, and, uh, you know, so so you can see all of the information. Module two agenda, we're going to be start, starting to look more specifically about a good job match and work experiences. And, and I, I think this is just awesome, so important. So the goal is not just any old job. The goal is a good job match. And the reason is because if we put individuals with disabilities into a job that we think is right for them or or we think is the only job that they can do, then chances are they're not going to be happy there. They're not going to be successful there because it doesn't match their strengths and their interests. And if they're not going to be successful there, they're going to end up bombing out. And then the narrative around this person becomes, well, we tried employment and it didn't work. And I desperately want to avoid that because we have the capability, if we make a good job match, we can support just about anybody in employment. And I think this is an important message to families because families are like, well, isn't a job a job? No, a job is not just a job because for us, a job isn't just a job. And then maybe what you do is you 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 ask them in, in the workshop, you say, I want you to tell me a job that you would just not be successful at. 
right? I mean, there's plenty of jobs that I can think of where I would just not be successful at it. It would be a bad match for my skills. It would be a bad match for my temperament. It would be a bad match for my age, whatever the case is, right? So this is the message to families. It is a good job match. And the another message is that everybody needs skills. Nobody is going to go and just say, oh, you have a kid with a disability. Let's just find him a job. The, the thing that we need to Im, impress on the families is that individuals with disabilities are individuals who have skills and we need to teach new skills. And the because any time that you get a job, a new job, you're going to be expected to learn something new. I could transition right now into a job that's almost exactly like the job I have right now, but I would still have to learn something new. I would have to learn new processes for expense sheets and new processes for turning in time cards and new processes for staff meetings, right? So this, in this, what I'm trying to say is encouraging families, no matter how small you think it is, keep teaching your son or daughter new things as often as possible. So you got a picture of somebody cooking and a picture of somebody working on a computer and a picture of, of a tire that needs to be changed. But anything that you teach your, your, your son or daughter is a transferable skill because they're learning how to learn new things. Everybody needs skills. We want to take a skills-based approach. And what I love, this is my favorite question of the whole workshop here. So you go back to the worksheet. What is your family member's greatest skill or attribute? Tell them that this is their opportunity to brag about their son or daughter. And, and no matter how small it is, I want you to list everything that makes your son or daughter awesome. And I also want to explain the difference between a skill and an attribute. A skill is, is something a little bit more tangible, right? A skill is, I am good at programming computers. I can, um, I'm great with animals. Whereas an attribute tends to be something like friendly, motivated, hardworking, creative. And, and we need both in the employment situation. Give the families time to fill this out, go around the room and have the discussion. And this is so powerful when you have the students right next to the family because the kids are hearing their moms and dads talk about them in a very positive way. I love it makes me so happy right and and this and this is in the message is we take those skills and we try to find a place where they can fit so one of the things that we know um, is that uh, kids in high school who have meaningful work experiences have better employment outcomes as adults therefore we must promote the idea of community-based work experiences for our kids in high school the opportunity to go into the community and practice a job that they think they might be interested in. Now, they may go practice and they may say, I'm not interested in this anymore. That happens, but that's okay because that's a good use of time. So this is particularly important for families who, ki who have kids are still in high school or middle school because work experiences should be woven into the individual education program. And the work experiences, I've listed the work experiences on the slide. Those are just examples of what work experiences look like. In the presenter notes, I explain them a little bit deeper, right? But the message to families here is this. Do not let the high school or transition years go without there being a lot of opportunities for your kid to practice the jobs they want. And that happens. I do a lot of work in schools. And unfortunately, it happens too often. The kids are just doing nothing. There's no employment goals on their IEP or they're wiping tables in the cafeteria or they're shredding paper in the office. And that's not a work experience, right? You don't, sh you don't shred paper for three years and call it a student's work experience. Unless you can meaning, unless they have expressed to you that shredding paper is their lifelong dream and that you can connect them to a job in the community where they can sit and shred paper. I don't know, right? An opportunity to practice a job that you want. Now, how can families play a role in this? We encourage families to use their own networks to be able to find these opportunities. And I tell them everybody has a network. Everybody has somebody 
that you go to book club with, you play golf with, your neighbors, your friends, your family, places that you do business. We all have a, a network of people. So let's say that your son or daughter says, I want to, I'm really interested in um, construction. And actually, really what I'm interested in is demolition, construction demolition. I want to be part of the team that tears stuff down and hauls it away. And you're like, okay, we need to get a work experience. We need to get a work experience there, right? So the kid can practice it. So who do we know in the community that does this? Maybe your school knows somebody, maybe they don't. But you as the family can help find those opportunities. And, and I, want, I really want to, to give families a sense of ownership and responsibility over some of the pieces that we're talking about here. Families are not passive participants in this process. They have to be partners. And in fact, with the lack of resources that we continue to see, we need to ask families to do even a little bit more to step up with things like transportation, right? Because if we want to see kids experience work, we all have to, we're, we're going to all have to chip in and, and play. Using their own networks is an absolutely wonderful way to do that. We also give them uh, some tips on building responsibility. Uh, this, I, I always say, you know, I ask people to raise their hand. How many people have you uh, have your, your son or daughter do chores at home? Usually it's about 70%. But almost inevitably, there's one there's, there's families in the audience that don't give their kids chores. And I'm like, why not? And they're like, well, it seems like it's kind of a pain. You know, I'm like, yes, but that is the way that we learn. Jobs in the house is the best way for us to learn because it's free. And it's something that, that, that we all did. We all have expectations to contribute to the household. So again, these are just some of the base level messages that we're trying to send families about things that they can do to help build skills in their son or daughter. We also advocate that, that their son or daughter get involved in any way, shape, or form, because we know that being involved in things outside of the home or outside of school are a way to build social and teamwork and problem-solving skills. So, so you got video game club and scouts and church groups and theater and choir and a community garden and sports. Just, and again, it, the, the core message here is, um, I know your, your son or daughter has a disability, but let's get them out there and get them involved in something that they're interested in because that has a lot of benefits. This might be an area where you all as, as advocates can, can expand on and help families understand how they can advocate for employment goals in the IEP. And this is very important. You may wish to have this be a separate section. You may wish to give them additional printed resources and how to do this. Again, there's a lot of different ways to augment the, um, the training. We talk about myths around employment. So these are all myths that I list on the slide. And, and, and we, just want to, we just want to let families know that, that misinformation and misunderstanding can really keep us from giving opportunities to individuals. And we, want to, we don't want that, right? So again, these are just things that we go through relatively quickly. And, and we hone in specifically on social security myths and resources here. This is not a social security workshop by any stretch of the imagination. But I do acknowledge that Social security tends to be one of the more significant barriers to employment. And you may wish to follow up this workshop with a workshop on understanding social security and having social security play the appropriate role in, in a person's life. Getting social security should not be a reason why somebody doesn't work because you almost always earn more working than you will on social security. And, and, and we need to let families know that key message as well as who to talk to, right? So we do talk about some employment supports because you can't really get away from it, but I, I don't spend a ton of time on it. Um, you guys may wish to spend more time on it. That's completely up to you. But we do give some information on how to maximize those services, right? So if you do get Volk Rehab, here are some ideas. Right. If you do get if you do have a case manager, here are some ideas. Um, again, you may wish to expand on that. We go to back to the worksheet. 
What do you need to feel hopeful and energized about your family member's employment future? Again, just a break and an opportunity to um, have conversations, have them fill in the worksheet and then share with you. And then that's the end of module two. Those are the key takeaways from our module. Back to the, to, back to the module listing, back to questions, and it leads us to module three. All right, let's pause here real quick and take a couple of questions before I, I show you the very last part of what it is that we put together. Okay, Sean, there's a question. How do you persuade a family members who prefer regularity and predictability of their programs and segregated employment to CIE, which generally requires more work from families? Well, that's the unfortunate question, isn't it, right? We have built systems that allow us to be pretty comfortable with what we have. And what we have is a great deal for families if they can get those resources, but does it truly create an enviable life for the individual? So that is my answer. You know, none of this happens quickly. There's no magic bullet. But what I would say is that, you know, um, there you go back to the benefits of employment slide and you also kind of talk about what does a good life look like? And is a good life for an individual sitting in a day program for six and a half hours, um, coloring in a color book or being thrown in a van and, and walking around a park? Or does a good life look like being able to go to a job as well, and, and and a lot of this is is about also how do we do better with our day services too. So that's my answer. You know, you're not going to convince all the families that employment is the way to go. You're just not. But we do want to make sure that when they think about employment, they're thinking about their loved one, and they're not thinking just about what's convenient for them, right? And that I mean, and that takes time, and you're not going to get always the positive response from it. Great question, though. Boy, that's the elephant in the room. Whoever asked that, you get the elephant prize. That was thank a great question. You. Yeah, thank you, Sean. And Leia's um, comment is also like an answer for that question. She says, I love this. It is more about raising expectations. Families have been told so many times by so many people that people with disabilities cannot, cannot do this. Uh, okay, another question. Sean, how do you handle the family that has a child that is non-responsive most of the day, almost like locked in syndrome that is in that is in the workshop. I focus on preferences, interests, needs, and strength to build some ideas and maybe starting with volunteering in environments that they like for socialization. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, there, there is a very, very small segment of the population where employment seems to be a lot more challenging than others, right? And we're talking about individuals who who are, are profoundly impacted by their disability. Um, and I say, again, this is where we break things down into very small steps. And this is where families, I think, become really, really important because we need to know from the families, you know, where does this person shine? Where does this per where is this person? How does this person express themselves? It might be a it might be a facial tick. It might be a hand movement. Is there is there anything that 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 this individual seems to enjoy um, doing or 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 being around? And is that the opportunity? I love that. Let's expose them to that environment. And let's see if there's a way for us to, to be able to use that. Now, again, it, it may be volunteering, right? It may be something a little bit different. Because um, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there aren't individuals out there that are, are very, very profoundly impacted by a disability and that employment is, is quite, quite difficult. But I still believe everybody can work. But it does take a ton, a ton of, of creativity. Um, so I, I appreciate you bringing it up. If I had the quick and easy answer to that question, I would be, I'd be writing books. I'd be a doctor like Josie. I just, you know, I don't, I don't have all of that at my disposal, but I'm glad that we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Um, let's do one, Mary. Let's do one more, and then I'll go on to module three. All right. So, has this presentation been adapted for individuals with disabilities directly to help increase their confidence? And if so, was it successful? No, uh, this is a, a parent training workshop. So this is written very specifically for the parent audience. If I were to present on um, employment to a group of self-advocates, it would look distinctly different. Um, so, I, And I'm a firm believer that if you're going to do family stuff, it should be written for families and and do it you know because that's the lens that that we're trying to um we're trying to talk through and and what we're trying to impact so no this i would not use this you can use some of the information and some ideas in, in a different type of presentation it was very much intended for families so you guys are great by the way thank you for all the positive comments let's do module three and then we can, Josie can talk us through a little bit about where this is, and you guys can ask all the questions that time will allow, because I love answering questions. So we've got the module three agenda. Really, module three focuses more on two things, addressing self-determination. So how do families play a role in increasing self-determination of their young people? And then how do we address questions and concerns that families have about employment, right? So. Some of you are probably familiar with the um, materials uh, found in Charting the Life Course. It's a person-centered uh, framework uh, out of the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, and it's just a wonderfully intuitive set of concepts and tools that allow for life planning and problem solving. And what I really like about Charting the Life Course is that it's free, right? Everything that they have to offer is free. Um, lifecoursetools.com. I don't know if somebody would throw that in the chat box for me. Lifecoursetools.com. That's the website. Everything is absolutely free. This is the core tenet of charting the life course. That all people have the right to live, love, work, and play and pursue their life aspirations in their community. Now, this may be a good answer to the person who talked about the families who were kind of very comfortable with what they have, because what this says is that individuals, all individuals, disability or not, have the right to live their own lives and to pursue hobbies and to work and to have relationships. And, and, and living in, in day services is very narrowing. And it doesn't really allow for the full extent of a person exploring and having new life experiences. That's what life is about, is having new life experiences. So that's what we want to get through in this module. It's talking with families about how we can empower their loved one to be able to live this life, right? That, that The enviable life that we talk about. And we start with defining self-determination and self-advocacy. Now, let me say that um, uh, I co-presented and co-authored uh, a webinar and a couple of briefs this year with my uh, friend, Dr. John McNaught from James Madison University. They are on the RAISE website. They're, they were done for RAISE and is all about helping families understand self-determination. And so there's just some additional resources for you on the topic. I hope that you guys have seen those or, or go dig those up. So self we, we define self-determination and self-advocacy. There is a difference. Um, the terms sometimes are used interchangeably, but really not. Are, they're really, they're two different concepts. So we want to get into why is this important? You know, families get very used to playing the role of decision maker for their loved ones. And um, we're trying to get them to see that their role can be changed to, to supporting their loved ones to reach the goals that they set for themselves. Never would say that the families are gonna step aside and completely, you know, but I would say that families do sometimes need to advocate that responsibility and let their loved ones make a lot more decisions, right? So self-determination has really been linked to a lot of things, including more improved employment outcomes, right? self-confidence and life satisfaction and quality of life. When you are an individual who are able to make your own decisions, 
your quality of life increases. Imagine that. And so, again, we're just trying to get families to see um, some of these pieces. Now, this is um, the uh, I'm Determined. So I mentioned Dr. John McNaught. He runs a program in Virginia called I'm Determined. This is the I'm Determined elements of self-determination. They're the nine things that are indicators or that we can work on with individuals to help them increase their self-determination. Um, and so we're going to go over these things in a little bit more detail um, during the course of the workshop here. But I like to use a, a group question. Uh, I use a lot of group questions. When I present, I throw stuff out into the group all the time. And so I, I, I thought for our purposes, it would be fun to ask the families, um, I want you to think back to your transition years. And I said roughly 12 to 22. How did you develop skills around these elements of self-determination? How did you begin feeling like you were making your own decisions, right? What were some of the, what was, what was the, the moment where you realized that you kind of were in charge and, and get them talking about that? Hopefully you can build some connections in their thinking about how do they help their loved one do that too, right? So there's nine elements of self-determination that we go through um, that are part of that, that grid that I just showed you, right? And then we give examples of what it looks like. So we, we define it and then we give an example of it. So choice making, for example, is the skill of selecting a path between two known options. Would you like this or this? Would you like to go out to eat or would you like to have chicken on the grill? This is, seems pretty remedial, but for a lot of families, they, 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 if they don't let their kids make any choices, this is the best place to start. And this is certainly a great place to start if you have young uh, families of younger kids, right? Just choosing between two or three options. Decision-making though is the skill of selecting a path forward based on various solutions. And so the example is, your room needs to be cleaned by Sunday at six. It's up to you to decide how to get it done between now and then. Now you can clearly see the link between that skill and employment. Because when you get to be on a job and you get to be on the shift, your boss is gonna go, listen, you need to take that display of Cheez-Its and you need to move it because we're having a display of wheat thins come in afterwards. It's being self-directed and making decisions based on that goal. Problem solving. You know, and during the course, when you, when you present this, you can ask families, are you doing anything currently to develop these skills, right? How did you learn problem solving when you were growing up, right? Um, goal setting is so important. Having a young person set e even a super small goal and being able to plan to reach the goal and to measure their success. Uh, 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 and there's a tool that we share called the I'm Determined Goal Plan that is, a, a, is part of your materials. And it's also in the slides here, which is a great way to do that. Self-regulation is the ability to monitor your own behaviors. Self-advocacy is the ability to speak up and defend a cause or a person. You know, we don't always let individuals with disabilities speak up for the things that they believe in or to contribute to their communities. You know, I know that they're, uh, 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 my brother, for example, he feels very strongly about things like social justice, you know, and he feels strongly about things like equity. You know, does he have the opportunity to work in that space and to impact his community? That would be a lot of, I think that would be great opportunity for him. The internal locus of control is the belief that you have control over outcomes that are important to you. So again, for, for young people with disabilities, if, if, if mom and dad make all the decisions, do, do they believe that they truly have control over their lives and the decisions that they make? And, and this should be age appropriate, practicing age appropriate ways to lead their own lives. And self-efficacy is related to that, which is the belief in that you're gonna be able to succeed in specific situations or accomplish specific tasks. And this is where things like acknowledgement and celebration come in. If somebody masters a new task, 
celebrate it. You know, in our house, we, with the kids, when they were younger, we celebrated little things all the time, you know, Hey, good job on that test. Let's celebrate, you know? And, and, and so the, I think it builds self-confidence when, when you believe that you can do things. And then finally, self-awareness is that understanding of your own strengths and needs and abilities. And, and that would be where that vision statement might come in. You know, the, a whole sheet on helping a person express their strengths and their needs and what they want and what they've accomplished. All of these things lead to an individual who can be a bit more self-determined. So I talked to you about the goal plan. This is all also free on imdetermined.org. The URL is over there on the left. Um, this is free. But this goal plan is a really a simple template that just says, here's my goal. Here are the steps to reach the goal. Here are the people who can help me reach my goal. And if I reach this goal, here are the great things that are going to happen, right? Those are the outcomes. Let's look at an example of that real quick. This is a young man that reached a goal that he wanted to be on the honor roll. And he thought, okay, if I'm on the honor roll, here are the great things that are going to happen. My mom and dad will be proud of me. I'll be proud of myself. My dad will take me out to lunch. I'll get money to buy something special. I will learn more in school. I'll be able to get a good job one day. Right. So look, he thought about these things, like not just reaching the goal, but here's what would happen if I reach this goal. And then he articulated the steps that he needed to get there. Right. So those four steps on the bottom is what he thought would get him there. So you can share this. You could do if you if you had students in the room, you could ask them to do a goal plan on something and have the families help them during the course of the workshops. Just another tool for you to, to look at and to share with families. Now, finally, we switch gears a little bit right to having questions and concerns. And it just as, as, a, as a family member of an individual with a disability myself, I always want to acknowledge that it's okay to have questions and concerns. We never, ever want to vilify families for, for having questions. But we want to tell them that it's, it's okay to be concerned about a real job in the community. And some of the common questions are listed on the slide, right? And so we also go to the worksheet and we ask them to write on the worksheet, what is your greatest concern about employment? And I do ask people to share out. It tends to be very emotional. Um, but I'm a firm believer that when families tell you what they're worried about, they tell you what they need. And having families practice expressing their worries rather than holding them in and making decisions based on those worries, I just think it's much healthier to get those worries out and to have them practice telling people about them. Because then we can do something about it, right? And so then, finally, it is just some action steps. Here are some possible next steps. I always want to leave families with some ideas of things that they can do next. Set the expectation that employment will be part of the future. Help your student explore interests. Make sure employment-related goals are in the IEP. Do community-based work experiences in the last two years of high school. Talk about disability disclosure with your student. Learn about skills needed to do the jobs they're interested in, because every job needs skills. Increase responsibility at home and ask about possible employment supports if the individual is going to need them. So finally, the very last thing on the worksheet is based on the information that we've shared, what are three action steps you will take to help start your family member on the path to employment success? Give them time to complete this, have them report out, right? You want them to leave with some firm, actionable ideas of what they are able to do next. There's your takeaways for the session. And then we go to the questions. And then finally, it's all the contact information. So what I'm going to do, because that's the end of the three modules, is I'm also going to share my contact information. So that's me. My son drew that for me. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Now, uh, I, I um, if you've got questions about accessing this or how to use this, I think that those questions should go to the folks at RAISE. 
Um, but if they have anything that I, I need to know about or anybody that wants to partner on anything, they will contact me and we can work together on stuff, right? So we're, we're one big happy family, but I, I would imagine that the questions um, go to go to uh, the race folks, but I wanted you to have my contact information as well. So with that, Josie, would you like me to um, stop sharing so you can show people where this is on the website or should we do questions? Sure. Let me show real quick um, because I know some folks are jumping off here momentarily. Um, so number one, Sean, thank you so much. As I'm booting this up, um, you always give such wonderful presentations. And um, as we speak, literally, folks, we are adding more to the web page. So if you go to raisecenter.org, you're going to come to our homepage. I'm sorry, sometimes sharing strands gets a little weird. Um, but what I want to show you is if you scroll down, on the home page, you'll see about raise, and then you're going to see kind of a glossary of our different areas or topics that we focus on. Okay. Um, and so you'll be able to see employment curriculum right there. On this page, there's a little description, and then you'll see that the modules are right here. Um, after this call, we will be adding the handouts, we'll be adding the PowerPoint, we are working on providing the editable version. Um, as was mentioned, right now it's PDF, but we will work on making sure that um, you're, you have access to the one that can be modified and the recording will be here as well. So once again, go to raisecenter.org, just scroll down on the homepage and you will find an employment curriculum and that's where we are. I also pre-recorded um, a kind of train the trainer yeah. video that will be there as well. It's it's a little bit shorter. Um, and if you wanted to share this with anybody, it, it kind of helps you walk through what how, how to do these things um, without the without the presentation format. So um, and this is what you'll see right here. And thank you, Sean, for bringing this up. Each of the modules have, just as he mentioned, a, a short video that goes with it. And so you can watch those um, because not everyone has an hour and a half of time to spend with us, which, you know, obviously is a loss. But yeah. um, we wanted to make sure that you guys could share it and other folks would have full access. So we got just uh, we got about eight minutes. So let's let's attack those questions. Thank you, everybody, from for, for hanging in. Uh, if you got any questions. Um, we, I know we've got some in there already. Feel free to throw them in there if you got uh, anything. Okay, there's a question here. Um, how do you handle shelter workshops versus competitive integrated employment in your workshops? I work in Oregon and have uh, we ended uh, shelter workshop and subminimal wage employment. So I am curious how other states handle this issue. Mm -hmm. You know, in in terms of the of the curriculum, here's what I would say: as long as sheltered work is a choice, it's a choice. And I I, I I'm not here to to passionately dissuade one way or the other. I, but I, what I want is to provide families with enough information so they can make an informed choice. So they can know that, that it's so much more than just a safe place for their kid to go. It's about what does a good life look like and, and sheltered work, working for pennies on the dollar. You know, I guess my feeling is if you can work for 98 cents, you can work for minimum wage. Because if you're doing enough work in a sheltered workshop, you know, and but, you know, it's not an easy thing all the time to especially in rural areas of this country where sheltered workshops are, are seen as the refuge. Um, it is an uphill battle. But thank you for the question. Great question. Um, one of those elephants in the room again. All right. There's another one here. Absolutely. The best person center planning tools. We use it with our families and I have used it with my son, my own son. Shift the conversation from what the person cannot do to what the person can do and what a good life 
would look like. So it's more like yeah, a she's comment. no doubt talking about charting the life course. Again, it's lifecoursetools.com. I, I do a lot of work with them um, and I, I just really love what they do and, and um, what it allows families to, to really think about as well as individuals. So if you're, if you're in an advocate capacity and haven't looked at charting the life course, um, I would encourage you to do so. And again, free, free, free. Uh, another question, how do you address disability biases within the family unit? Well, that's that's a tough one, isn't it? And I, I don't I don't necessarily address the biases so much as try to take a strength based approach in my conversations. I was working in a school in Indiana um, last year and did an interview with a, a mom and the mom wanted to tell me all the different reasons why her daughter couldn't work. And we kept redirecting the conversation towards well, what are her skills and attributes and what, um, where does she shine and what does she do at home? And, and told her if, if we found the right situation, um, we, you know, would you be willing to, to explore employment? And she said, well, yeah. And in the end, she sent an email thanking us saying, you know, basically, sorry for being Debbie Downer. It's just so easy for me to think about the negative sometimes. So it's that strength-based approach. Everybody has skills. Um, if we find them, we know how to nurture them and support them. Um, but yeah, you know, I think sometimes families get into a safety zone where it's just easier to think about, um, it's think easier to, to, to manage life and expectations if they think that way. That's a great question too. Another one, what advice would you give to parents or even advocates when they face issues getting through to certain government agencies? Sometimes it is difficult to get in touch with people or even hear back. It can be very discouraging. 100%. Um, every single uh, government agency will have some type of a protection and advocacy um, mechanism. You know, so for example, vocational rehabilitation has the client assistance project. But I always tell families just to climb the ladder, meaning that if you have a case manager that's not being responsive, you go to their supervisor and then you go to that person's supervisor until finally somebody will, will listen to you. Um Nobody, if you're in a supervisory capacity, nobody wants to hear that your your staff aren't being responsive. But I know that that it's it's a it's kind of an epidemic, unfortunately, of poor service within the human services. Um, so I think that's that's what look at client uh, kind of the advocacy arms. Um, you know, the arcs around the country do a great job with that advocacy piece as well. Another one. Can you suggest any resources with examples of employment IP goals? You know, I don't have any offhand. I think that's a great that's a great question. And in fact, maybe that's something that we would not want to take a look at, Josie, as we as we think about expanding this information about work that we really I mean, I know that they're out there, right? For sure. But but um you know, I think you're right. A, a really good, concise resource on what a quality employment goal looks like in an IEP. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, don't know of one. Not to say that they're not out there, but I think it's needed. Well, it looks like we're at time. I'm going to hand it back over, but let me just say, first of all, thank you all for your interest in this topic. It's near and dear to my heart. Um, let me know if you use it, uh, if you have any questions. Um, and Josie and Miriam and Lauren uh, and uh, our interpreters today, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Sean. And um, you will be receiving an email with a recording and the PowerPoint um, in the next week or so. And as I mentioned before, the modules, the PowerPoint, the handouts will all be available on the employment curriculum 
link on the rizcenter.org website. Thank you all for joining us and have a great holiday season. I can't believe I'm saying that, but um, we'll be talking to you via our web next webinar in early 2024. Um, and thank you for real for being a partner on this work. And we will talk to you all soon.